Well, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you all to GIFCON 2021 and to the first keynote of the event, which will be given by the internationally renowned science fiction writer, Xia Zha. Uh, and um, I'd like to begin by just mentioning a, a word of thanks. Um, Xia was convinced that this was all happening at six o'clock in Chinatown, uh, China time, and uh, um, has, uh, what, but, but the wonderful Guang Zhao, who, who is in yes. the UK, was able to inform her that it's actually happening at five o'clock. So thanks to Guang Zhao, we are able to have this uh, this keynote. Uh, if he's if he's watching, I'd like to to, to, to thank um, thank them very much. He's indeed. watching. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so Professor Wang Yao, uh, known nice. around the world as Jia Jia, uh, is uh, is going to be talking to us very shortly. But uh, before that, I'd like to begin by thanking the University of Glasgow's Confucius Institute for its financial and practical support in enabling us to welcome Professor Wang to Glasgow, albeit in virtual form. Uh, I hope one day it'll be in real form. Uh, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the, the great help of Dr. Nathan Woolley. Wang Yao is uh, Associate Professor of Chinese Literature at Xi'an uh, Jiao Tong University and was a visiting scholar at the University of California, Riverside from May 2019 to May 2020. Uh, um, I imagine you worked with uh, um, Nalo, uh, Nalo Hopkinson while you were there. I, I hope so. <laughs> um, she started out by majoring in the atmospheric sciences at Beijing University and went on to take a master's in film studies and gain a PhD in comparative literature. Her collection of essays on contemporary Chinese science fiction, Coordinates of the Future, Discussions on Chinese Science Fiction in the Age of Globalization, was published in 2019, but she's been publishing speculative fiction since her college days under the pen name Xia Jia. Seven of her stories have won the Galaxy Award, China's most prestigious prize for science fiction. And so far she's published a fantasy novel called The Odyssey of China Fantasy on the Road of 2010, as well as three science fiction collections, The Demon Enslaving Flask, a time beyond your reach, and Xi'an City is falling down. Recently, she's been working on a science fiction fix-up called Chinese Encyclopedia. In English translation, she's been published in Clark's World and other venues, one of her translators being the celebrated fantasy writer Ken Liu. Her first flash story written in English, Let's Have a Talk, was published in Nature in 2015. And the first English collection, A Summer Beyond Your Reach, Stories, was published in 2020. She's also engaged in other science fiction related works, including academic research, translation, screenwriting, editing, and the teaching of creative writing. Today's talk is entitled, Which Future Do You Believe In? Ladies and gentlemen, everybody, Shaja. Okay, can Robert? Can you can you see my screen? Robert, you muted yourself. Um, no, uh, we can see it beautifully. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, so I just uh, start from the very beginning. Um, I'll just skip the self introduction part. I just uh, to explain a bit why I have like the two identities, double identities. One is Wang Yao, and another one is Xia Jia. And if you prefer, you can just try to um, challenge yourself and try to pronounce my first name of my pen name, Xia. And Xia means summer, and I like this name very much. And so I just uh, try to speed up to my uh, speech today. Uh, basically, uh, the content of my, um, the thing I want to talk is just like the, it's, Sorry, I'm just a bit of confused. So this is an abstract of my speech today. And I want to talk about the visions of future in each period of history and which are involved with the changing structure of feelings and the experience of media. And the science fiction as mega text refers to its own intertextuality in order to be functional at all times. Uh, the audience is 
interpolated to answer that question, do you believe in what we used to believe in? So that you imaginatively identify with we and sometimes fails to do so. So what I want to talk about is uh, like, um, I want to use three uh, text as a case studies to try to explain my thought, which is actually very immature on this topic. And uh, finally, I want to use this approach as a, um, as a maybe workable way to discuss about contemporary Chinese science fiction, especially its uh, writing modes in different periods of time. Okay, so let's start from the first one. Uh, this is uh, Tomorrowland, the movie by Disney movie. Uh, so in this movie, uh, a teenage, the, the, the main character, uh, her name is Casey. She's a teenage space enthusiast. She happens to get a pain and while touching it, she found herself in Tomorrowland, a futuristic cityscape. And uh, next I will try to um, share my video player to show part of this, uh, this video. But where is it? Let me try to find it. So uh, in this five minutes clip, you can see that Casey uh, just, uh, we follow, we, we as audience follow Casey to experience a series of magical things, including stimuli architecture, vertical forests, jetpacks, Buck Rogers outfits, levitating elevated vehicles, floating swimming pools, reusable rockets, etc. And her adventure is cut short when the pain, uh, the pain's battery runs out. Later, she gets to know that such tomorrow land exists in a parallel timeline, which have been recruiting dreamers to join in. So this tour in Tomorrowland she experienced is actually an immersive VR promotional video. Okay, next page. However, when Casey eventually travels to Tomorrowland, she finds it in a state of decay. The cynical governor, David Nix, as you can see in this slide, the picture, this is David. Uh, he informs her that there was a machine which can accurately predict the worldwide catastrophe. David tried to prevent the future by, by projecting the dark images to humanity as a warning. Instead, uh, the humanity, they just uh, embraced the, uh, the catastrophic future, refusing to act to make a better future, which created a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Um, so because Casey refuses to accept the world will end, which caused the future images to temporarily alter. In this case, the key to save humanity is to stop the doom consciousness to be spreaded. Successfully destroying the machine, Casey and her companions take the place of David to govern Tomorrowland, distribute the pains and recruit new dreamers, the younger dreamers, for the construction of Tomorrowland. Okay. And uh, Actually, Tomorrowland, this movie follows the very, very conventional Disney theme, do you believe in? But here, magic is replaced by another concept, which is the future dream once upon a time we used to believe in. As Brad Bird, the director of the movie states, when we were little, people had a very positive idea about the future, even though there were bad things going on in the world but there was a sense we could overcome them. And yet now we act like we are passengers on a bus with no say in where it is going, with no realization that we collectively write the future every day and can make it so much better than it otherwise would be. So this future dream is uh, in this movie is traced back to the 1950s to 1960s when the America dream represented by Disney's culture industrial um, empire got to its peak. Tomorrowland actually is greatly inspired by Epcot, 
which is experimental prototype community of tomorrow, an unfinished concept for a planned community developed by Walt Disney in the 1960s. Its purpose was to draw upon the latest technology and innovation from American industry to be a showcase to the world for the ingenuity and the imagine, uh, imagination of American free enterprise. In October 1966, a 25-minute long film was shot wherein Walt Disney explains the concept and vision of Epcot. Two months later, he passed away, so the plan was abandoned by Walt Disney production thereafter. Except for Epcot, Tomorrowland absorbs a series of other interrelated cultural elements, including the 1964 Wars Fear and the Space Age memes and the pop science fiction iconography. On January 23rd, 2013, uh, Brad Bird tweeted a picture showing a frayed cardboard box labeled 1952, supposedly uncovered in the Walt Disney Company archives. As you can see uh, in my slides, the picture is a 1952 box picture. And uh, this box contains items like uh, photographs of Walt Disney, uh, Technicolor film, uh, envelopes, a vinyl record, and a book entitled Model Research, the National Adversary Committee for Aeronautic, Aeronautics 1915-1958. And uh, this committee actually is the precursor of NASA. And there's another one I think most of you should be very, very familiar with, which is a 1928 copy of Amazing Stories. And uh, of course, this box was just a little something for promoting the project with 1952 as a working title by them. Its purpose was to arouse feelings of mysterious as well as nostalgia. And uh, the issue of Amazing Story is notable for introducing the Buck Rogers character and uh, its cover illustrated by Frank R. Paul shows a jetpack wearing hero in the Skylark of space. So that's what, maybe probably the most famous uh, cover in the history of science fiction. And uh, so in this sense, Tomorrowland can be recognized as a super media movie which is just uh, the same as other movies such as Ready Player One and the Marvel franchise. So uh, all of these movies intend to establish a cultural identity by referring to the audience common experiences of certain media. It interpolates the audience to give a positive answer to that question. Do you believe in what we used to believe in? Therefore, uh, all of this lonely individual you imaginatively identify with the collective V. Okay, this is uh, the first text tomorrowland. And the next, I want to talk about another interesting text, the short story the, uh, by William Gibson, uh, published in 1981, which is also his very first professional publication. And its title is The Gersbach Continuum. So in this story, the narrator is an American photographer who is assigned to photograph 1930s period, uh, 1930s period futuristic American architecture by London publishers to capture a kind of alternative, a kind of alternate America, a 1980 that never happened, an architecture of broken dreams. During his journey in California, he encounters a series of illusions, uh, uh, an utopian continuum of things like flying wings and uh, aircrafts, multi-lane highways, giant zeppelins, and uh, alien inhabitants. His friend Kim attributes this to what he calls uh, semiotic ghosts which are the remnants of mass culture in the collective 
unconsciousness. And um, it is very clear that this gun spark continuum is in the same way as uh, in the same vein as Tomorrowland, though the the narrator's attitude is um, the narrator's attitude dramatically differs from Casey. For the narrator, the ones who cling to the continuum had gone on and on in a dream logic that knew nothing of pollution, the finite bonds of fossil fuel or foreign words it was possible to lose. And the such vision had all the sinister fruitness of Hitler youth propaganda. So uh, King advises the narrator to watch lots of television, particularly game shows and, so and soaps and poor movies, because really bad media can exor exorcise, really bad media can exorcise the semiotic ghost. But it doesn't work. So in the end of the story, the narrator turns to other really bad media. He gathers up as much as he could find on the petroleum crisis and the nuclear energy hazard at a new stand. So as one of the early stories of Gibson, the Gunsbach continue declares war against of the bright future dominating the science fiction tradition, while other stories like uh, Johnny Mnemonic and the uh, Burning Chrome envision a too much darker future. Tomorrowland has, has been replaced by Night City thereafter. As Nada states in a review of Burning Chrome that Continuum is very much about a central tenet of cyberpunk, that this world is one where the capital F future isn't going to arise. As Gibson later put it, because here, at least, the vision of the future is insanity. The vein of cyberpunk sprouts from the fracture of the Gunsbach continuum. For Brad Bird, perhaps Gibson is that is that antagonist who spreaded the doom consci consciousness and the stifled Tomorrowland in the cradle. As David Nix do. For Gibson, though, only the ones who live in the heart of the dream, which is America, which is California, which is actually Hollywood. Only these people can overlook the exception of catastrophe, can be smug, happy, and utterly content with themselves and their world. As the narrator complains, Los Angeles was a bad idea. Too much of the dream there and too many fragments of the dream waiting to snare me. He is captured by illusion and nearly wrecked the car near Disneyland, while Hollywood is full of people who look too much like the inhabitants of the dream. That is why in the end of story, the narrator decides to buy a plane ticket for New York. When the seller at the newsstand says, here of the world we live in, huh? But it could be worse, huh? The narrator replies, that's right, or even worse, it could be perfect. So uh, in what Disney's original plan for Epcot sounded like an airy futuristic dystopia, Kristen indicates that as an uh, autocratic company town completely controlled by Walt Disney himself, Epcot can be a fairly bad place to live in. Meanwhile, William Gibson compares Singapore to Disneyland in his famous nonfiction article, Disneyland with the death penalty, criticizing the techno technocrat uh, technocracy and uh, consumerism in the disguise uh, of perfection. And uh, another even more interesting critical case comes from the movie Snowpiercer. Uh, in the movie, on the way to the first class compartment, the rebels encounter a Disney style classroom, theme park, which is also an ideology machine. In this machine, a blonde teacher plays a short animated film about the myth of Virfu's empire and uh, leads the children in a chorus singing about Virfu's grand dreams. So that's the second one. 
And uh, I think this comparison of Tomorrowland and the Gunspark continue, as well as a focus on the visions of the future and the media, provides me a framework to trace the development of contemporary Chinese science fiction. Two of my previous papers are inspired by such framework, which were published in Chinese with no English translation yet. But I just uh, want to introduce the content a bit here. So the first one is entitled From Mini Song to Chinese Song, the utopian chronotrope uh, in contemporary Chinese science fiction. In this paper, I try to analyze a typical writing mode in contemporary Chinese science fiction an utopian future vision manifesting from 1950s to 1970s, as well as its most frequent images, uh, such as man-made song, Mars, science city, future city, citizens of universe, community of new people, etc. And I focus on three groups of texts. The first one represents the peak of this utopian chronotope. The second, the second one shows its internal fracture, while the third one shows how its semiotic ghosts and fragments wandering in the age of post-revolution. And uh, another paper is Brief New World or Da Tong World, The Digital Revolution and Its Cultural Politics in Contemporary Chinese Science Fiction. In this paper, I try to follow the development of Chinese cyberpunk science fiction or I think a more accurate description is internet video game science fiction uh, since the late 1980s. The main focus of these discussions is the mode of production, class struggle, cultural hegemony, and the commonwealth in the age of digital capitalism. Behind, the, uh, behind these two groups of discussions, a deeper problematics is in contemporary Chinese science fiction writing, how could this question of do you believe in be posed? How the audience in the uh, how the audience be interpolated to identify with we and how such interpolation fails? So next I want to introduce another interesting text, which is Liu Cixin's most recent novel, Fields of Gold to provide a case study to this approach. So um, this novella already ha uh, has already been translated into English and published in um, the two, uh, 12 Tomorrows, uh, edited by, uh, published by MIT Reviews. So uh, the novel tells a rescue operation in space that lasts from 2043 to 2062. The main character, Alice, uh, is a teenage girl, and uh, she's, uh, she's the only passenger in the malfunctioned spaceship, Fields of Gold, and she's stranded in a long drift into the deep space. Alice uses a hibernating drug to prolong, his, uh, to prolong her survival. Hundreds of millions of people around the world experience and share her journey through the VR network. The young woman drifting away from home second by second poured everyone's hard strings. Concern for Alice's fate gradually became a part of daily life. The era of Alice had arrived. So that's very important, the concept of the era of Alice. And 19 years later, when the rescue ship Orion finally catches up with fields of gold, it is revealed that the whole accident was deliberately planned by Alice and her father in order to rekindle the passion for space exploration for humans who have been addicted to virtual reality for decades. The hibernating drug does not exist. Alice died when the life supporting resources were used up as early as several days after, after the fuse of gold took off. All the greetings and the video recordings during the journey are created by intelligent simulation. And in Alice's last message, she explains the, the implication of fields of gold by an ancient tale. It says that uh, there used to be an old man who tells his children before dying that 
there is plenty of gold buried in the wasteland. By digging frantically day by day, the children fail to find the gold, but turns the wasteland into fertile land instead. So in the end of story, it is implied that the people on Earth are touched by this message and get ready to embrace the space again. Um, actually, this text is quite controversial. Someone just love it and someone just hates it. Uh, and I think for most readers who are familiar with Lucy Hin's work, this story may bring up no big surprise because the very same of the choice between space exploration and virtual reality has been discussed in Liu Cixin's several essays and interviews. Even the characters and the plot of the story is similar to Liu Cixin's early work, With Her Eyes, which has, uh, also has an uh, English translation. Uh, in, in that story, in With Her Eyes, uh, the, the main character is a young female pilot who is stranded in the depths of the earth. And the narrator, who is a male, shares vision with the female by our remote sensing glasses. That's the, what the title implies, with her eyes, which means like share visions. However, uh, what I want to argue here is that it is such repeat makes up the very contest of the novella to be read. Since, since the Three Body Problem trilogy was published eight years ago, the readers have been waiting for a message from Liu Cixin eagerly, as well as the fans of Alice waiting for the agonists to wake up from hibernation. So that is in this moment, Liu Cixin in the voice of Alice raises that question, raises that question to his fans. Do you believe in what we used to believe? And it probably seems paradoxical that Liu Cixin on one hand blames humans' inertness on internet, video games, and virtual reality. And on the other hand, resorts to the promise that all human beings emphasize with Alice through VR network to establish the, the emotional logic of the whole story. So what I want to emphasize here is that just as Gunspark Continuum is rooted in pop magazines, comics, and uh, surreal films, the very media which Alice Dream is rooted in is less virtual reality than a much more old-fashioned one, which is radio. The Orion rescuing fields of gold as the most exciting moment in human history when hundreds of, of millions of people listen to Alice telling that story provides a very important, precious, magical simultaneously. And uh, so um, in the postscript for American edition of the Three Body Problem, as well as in many other essays, Liu Cixin repeatedly recollects the moment when Dong Fang Hong, uh, the first artificial uh, the, the first artificial satellite of China was launched in 1970. Uh, by the way, the name of Dong Fang Hong means the East is Red. So I think that was a moment when Liu Cixin and many other individuals identify with that big we. Thereafter, uh, therefore, the political subject emerged. And such moment actually manifest in Liu Cixin's works again and again. Uh, for example, in his very first novel, unpublished work, China 2185, a female national leader wants the people and persuaded them to vote for their rights through the national computer network. In his later work, Supernova Arrow, the young Chinese leaders calls on the children addicted in virtual space to unite again, uh, to unite against the foreign invaders, and the children are called upon inst instantly as a core uh, crystal crystal crystallized in as a core crystallized into the diamond. In the glory and the dream, tens of thousands of Chinese people and the Republic of West Asia people cheer for the main character Sini. Uh, she's a female long-distance runner. 
um, in the Olympic Games, they encourage her to run to the end. And uh, of course, we should all recognize how the cosmos, uh, co how the cosmic broadcast, how the cosmic broadcast plays a major role in the Three Body Problem trilogy for several times. So due to time limit, I will not continue to analyze all of this text, but to give one more example instead. It is from the movie, The Wandering Earth, released in uh, 2019. So uh, this story is about like uh, rescuing the humankind. And uh, you can see from the poster that in the very center of the poster uh, is the main character, the leading character. His name is Liu Qi. He is a young, young male. And the bigger figure behind Liu Qi is Liu Qi's father. His name is Liu Qi Qiang, he's an astronaut. And uh, there's a very little figure just uh, in the left of Liu Qi. She, her name is Han Duo Duo. She's a young female, a teenage female. She is adopted by Liu Pi Qiang. So she's a kind of like a Liu Qi's stepsister. And she's actually not very important in the whole storyline. But in the very end of the story, she played a very important role. And uh, that moment is a crucial moment when all the rescue operations fail and all humans are overwhelmed by this pyre. And uh, just at that moment, the teenage girl Han Dodo calls for help through the global broadcast. So next I will uh, play a short video from this movie to show how this broadcast, uh, how this broadcast uh, plays a main function in this movie. To my slides, so we can see that this broadcast just uh, transforms the plot. We just uh, uh, play a very important uh, role in this plot to persuade the audience that the human kind of still wants to be rescued. And uh, uh, here we can see that actually uh, this movie, uh, as many of you may already know, that is adapted from Liu Cixin's another novel, The Vendor Earth. So this argument of uh, shall we still believe in hope is actually uh, quoted from the original novel. Uh, but in the novel, it is stated by the father, the Liu Pichang's role, to his family, not a very public speech, a speech, but a very personal speech. So we can compare these two uh, arg arguments and uh, we can see that it just, uh, just uh, repeats the same meaning. But what is important here is that when this opinion, this we should believe in hope, is posed to mobilize the people all of the, all of the world, it is obvious, it is obvious that the proper one to send out the message must be handled or the teenage girl, just as um, Casey in Tomorrowland or Alice in the Fields of Gold, not the leading character Liu, Liu Qi, not Liu Peiqiang, even though the character of Liu Peiqiang is played, is casted by the most influential tough guy actor Wu Jing. And uh, this thing actually is controversial as well as Fields of Gold. Some audience just uh, criticize it as affected and uh, unpractical, while some others, including me, are deeply touched by this thing. So, okay, so this is uh, uh, mostly what I want to share today and uh, to give a very quick conclusion, uh, as well as actually un uh, unresolved question is that, what I want to discuss is that in the age of post-revolution, post-Liu Cixin, or post-epidemic, how Chinese science fiction can continue to tell the story of we still believe in something. The something can be future, can be hope, or be something what we used to believe in. So here uh, in the right of the slide, there's uh, uh, my draw one of my drawings. And uh, in the drawing, you can see there's a uh, beautiful um, teenage girl who is watching the red train passing the horizon. So for me, I think the red train represents hope. And uh, where can we find it? That's an uh, un, uh, unresolved question. And uh, uh, I want to say that in my future research, 
on science fiction. And uh, as well as in my future science fiction writing, I will continue to think about this question and to try to give answer. So that's the end of my speech. Thank you very much. Okay, just uh, stop. Thank you so much uh, for an absolutely uh, fascinating talk and uh, achieved under the most difficult conditions. Uh, it's absolutely uh, appallingly difficult having to start off out of uh, um, cold from a, a situation of having been cut off by uh, uh, by, by technology from the from the rest of us. Uh, but you gathered it together magnificently. Um, what I drew from it uh, in a um, was a sense of the changing structure of feelings, which you mentioned near the beginning of your talk. Uh, and it struck me that, uh, that that is one of the things that really distinguishes your own science fiction from um, much of the science fiction that I've read in the past. And that is your passion for feeling. Um, it may be that, uh, that, that uh, hope is one of the elements that uh, you're identifying. I mean, do, do you see hope as something which is a, uh, a feeling? Or do you feel that it's something that is a uh, um, that, that, that has a, a greater sort of functionality, or do you see feeling as, in a sense, bound up with certain functions? Yeah, that's a very good question, and actually a bit complicated. But I just yes. will try <laughs> yes. to make it easier to answer. That I think that hope is is something we can hardly imagine in this age. As I said that in this age of uh, digital um, capitalism or late capitalism uh, or the post revolution, the age of post revolution. So it's very hard to imagine where can we find that hope. But what is important is that to have some feelings of commonwealth, uh, which need to be, I think need to be re, uh, reconstructed not to resort to some old things. Of course, we, we still need to call for the ghost to come back because the ghost is something which is repressed by the dominant culture uh, structure in this age. So we need to resort to that ghost. But ghost, uh, more, I think ghost, the, the ghost more uh, related to feelings to our bodies instead of our, for example, logic, our reason. So I think that's why I tried to discuss how can we build up a re like a feeling of reconnection uh, in this age. Uh, sometimes I may need to uh, to do to to do so through like technological methods, and sometimes we had to think about something other than the technology, or can we find ways to reuse? the technologies, not just restricted to the ways which the designers, the uh, entrepreneurs who design the technologies want us to use the technologies in that way. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I would have liked to have uh, given the opportunity to our, uh, our audience to uh, ask questions as well. But I'm afraid we're going to have draw to draw to a close because um, time is against us and the next panel starts at 11.15. Um, but I'm going to see if we can find a way to send questions from the audience to you, which you might be able to uh, to answer perhaps by uh, by some other means than in, in the content. I think, I think uh, maybe people want to post questions on Discord and then we can collect them and maybe send them over and, and, and find a way to sort of respond to those. But just to say thank you as well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. And it was deeply moving as well. Okay, right. So I'm going to end this session now. And there's just about enough time to move to our uh, to our first uh, panels for the day. Thanks again to Sierra for a brilliant, brilliant talk. Um, and yes, we'll see you all very soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.